Tom Clancy, one of the best-selling authors of our time, he has virtually created the genre of the techno-thriller. His books have crossed over into film, television, even video games. And the Tom Clancy name is iconic in modern gaming. Over the past two decades, the late military fiction author has been attached to multiple blockbuster franchises, including Ghost Recon, Rainbow Six, Splinter Cell, and The Division. Millions of gamers love playing Tom Clancy games, but not me. I find them boring. That's ironic because I am the target audience for Tom Clancy games. I love military history, my favorite video game genre is realistic shooters, and I've read almost a dozen Tom Clancy books. I should be buying and playing and praising every single Tom Clancy game. But I don't, and it's because none of them are new or exciting. The modern Tom Clancy games are reiterations of stale game mechanics within the same worn out genre. I'm not excited to play these generic military shooters with a realistic but strictly non-political storyline because I've already played games like them dozens of times. Which is a shame, because the Tom Clancy library includes some really crazy stuff. What Ubisoft needs to do, and I know their loyal Subpixel subscribers, is dig through his backlog of works and make something new and unique from them. I'll even help them get started. Here's three unused Tom Clancy properties that would make for great video games. The Hunt for Red October is a Cold War thriller about a defecting Soviet naval commander and the top secret submarine he takes with him. In his trip from the Arctic to the Atlantic, he has to deal with an unsuspecting crew, a threatening Navy in pursuit, and communicating with America in secret. It was Tom Clancy's first novel and arguably his most famous, even spawning a Hollywood adaptation starring Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin. I get excited about the potential of the hunt for Red October because submarines are criminally underrepresented in video games. There have been simulator games like Silent Hunter that capture the technical aspects pretty well, but I'm more interested in the human aspect. What does it feel like to play cat and mouse in a metal shoebox hundreds of meters below the ocean? And how do you keep from going insane while fighting an enemy you can't see? Imagine a first-person game that takes place entirely in a submarine. You'd have to issue crash dive orders over the intercom, fix urgent repairs with limited supplies, plot nav charts on the command table, and talk down mutinous sailors threatening to riot over low rations. And the whole time you'd be surrounded by the dim light of CRT screens and metallic groans of metal under stress, constantly aware of the thin hull separating you from instant death. Patriot Games is, quite frankly, an oversimplification of the Northern Ireland-UK IRA conflict. It stars an American tourist who stops an IRA attack on Buckingham Palace and then is hunted for revenge by the very same terrorist he stopped. Also, the American tourist is Jack Ryan, and he's a former Marine hero who teaches at the Naval Academy and gets recruited by the CIA and later becomes President of the United States because of a Japanese kamikaze attack on the Capitol building. Listen, Tom Clancy books go to some very weird places. What I like about Patriot Games is the idea of being hunted. Most macho anti-terrorism video games have you enter an area, shoot hundreds of enemies, and then leave. It's nothing but wall-to-wall -wall combat in predefined encounters. A video game based on Patriot Games would be the opposite. The gameplay would be shopping for groceries or working in the office or picking up your kids. But at any moment, gunmen could appear and inflict terrible harm upon you and your family. In that split second, how would you survive? And how would you stop it from happening again? Violence is the duct tape of game design, vastly overused in place of more inventive mechanics. But a game that focuses on the threat of violence and the emotional aftermath of it could be something very special. He who controls all information controls the world. The Net Force series is Tom Clancy's vision of how a global police force would work in an increasingly digital near future. Picture terrorist organizations that only meet in VR, hackers who kill using over-the-air bioscripts, and rogue digital countries with millions of citizens but no actual territory. That's the question presented by NetForce. How does policing and threat management change in an increasingly cyber world? 
for all the techno fetishism of modern Tom Clancy games. I'm picturing a NetForce game as something different. More of a political thriller with a slower, more investigative pace. You'd be scouring VR crime scenes for IP traces, searching cloud databases for shipping anomalies, tracking suspects with targeted viruses and micro drones. All of that while weaving between legal gray areas and strained international relations. Most video games only show technology as a tool for violence. Why not make a game that also presents it as an arbiter of unwilling societal change? I know that some of these ideas are pretty outlandish, and none of them are easy to make. They would require lots of out-of-the-box thinking in game design, player mechanics, narrative structure, etc. But great video games aren't made from a formula, or by making the same thing again. Innovation requires taking bold risks in unexpected directions. I want to enjoy playing Tom Clancy games again. Oh, hello there. You've caught me practicing my reading. Boy, I sure wish I wasn't illiterate. Clearly you've enjoyed another Subpixel video. If you could like, comment, or subscribe, it lets us and it lets YouTube know that our content is worth watching. In the meantime, I'm going to get back to pretending.